Welcome everyone to our Sound for Video session. Today's the 23rd of August, 2020, and uh, we're doing a question and answer session today. So let's go to our agenda. Let's see what we've got here. All right, so first up, for uh, those that are into live streaming, we do have a new Sound for Live Streaming course with the A10 Mini, and um, that's available over at school.learnlightandsound.com if you are interested. And we're probably going to start, get started on another course, and I'm still trying to kind of sort out which one that's going to be. The Kind of the main contenders are a lighting course, kind of a basics in lighting, fundamentals in lighting, um, but there are also some audio courses that we have that are kind of in the contention for the next slot there. So in any case, um, let's talk about a few things. Before we jump into the question and answer, I wanted to cover a couple of... Um, terms that you see in the audio world once you start digging in a little bit more. And the first one is called A-weighting. And the reason I want to kind of bring this up is it's something you see, for example, if you look at the specifications on microphones, um, you'll see it in other places as well, as far as audio is concerned. So I wanted to just kind of take a look at it. And the best way to describe A-weighting from my point of view is that, you know, and anyone in the chat here, correct me if, if you if you think I'm wrong, but the main idea is that human hearing is more sensitive at certain frequencies than others. And so what an A-weight, an A-weighted curve does is it essentially, when you're, when you're trying to convey something about the specifications of a microphone, for example, um, you really want to focus on the frequencies that humans can hear the most. And so that's what an A-weighted, um, when, when you apply an A-weight to something, what it's doing is kind of putting the priority on the frequencies that we can hear. So for example, you'll see this specification, um, the EIN, so kind of basically the input noise, the estimated input noise on um, you know different gear. And the idea is that they apply an A weight to that to kind of focus on the frequencies that humans can hear most. Now, what's interesting, if we switch over, there's another thing here. Um, that's kind of related to this. And in fact, if, if we switch over to the other tab here, we've also got some information on equal loudness contours. And I think traditionally it was actually generally referred to as Fletcher Munson curves. And the idea here, if we kind of zoom in on this little graph, um, what we're seeing here is that the x-axis, the one on the bottom there, is the frequency range. So on the left you have your bass sounds and on the right you have your treble or your high pitched sounds. And then the y-axis, the vertical axis there, is the sound pressure level. So what's interesting if you look at, you know, down at 20 hertz, the sound pressure levels have to be a lot more intense to sound the same as something that's at 1000 hertz. That's basically what that curve is telling us. And then you have, um, then likewise, you can so, so you can basically see that humans are most sensitive in terms of what they hear from about 100 hertz, um, kind of starting at 100 hertz, and then they go up to, you know, somewhere around 2 kilohertz or 3 kilohertz, and then it starts getting such that we can't hear it quite as sensitively as we could earlier than that. So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon, and you can actually experiment with that if you, you know, if you go into... A digital audio workstation and you can kind of play around and generate some tones and make them the same amplitude play them back you'll notice that the really low frequencies at the same amplitude as a 1000 hertz frequent you know tone that you create will not sound as loud so it's really an interesting kind of phenomenon so that's the kind of today's basic lesson <laughs> in um, audio terms a weighting and fletcher munson curves also known as equal loudness contours. So just some concepts to kind of keep in mind. They'll help you kind of navigate your way around a little bit better. All right, um, we saw a few Super Chats come in. So thanks for everyone who has uh, contributed so much. Um, this is all going uh, to the Emma Judd uh, University Fund. She starts school again tomorrow. <laughs> and she's pretty stoked about that as she's shaking her head. No, not really, but... Um, all right, let's switch over to the question and answers. We have a, a number of things to cover here today. Some really, really great questions. So first up from our friend Spike over in Sydney. Um, greetings from Sydney. You often mentioned your usual interview documentary setup with 
wireless lavalier on the talent to complement primary sound from the main boom mic. My question relates to post-production and the matching of sound from the various sources. In your DAW, do you strive to match the boom mic sound quality to the lavaliers or vice versa? Or is it horses for courses depending on which source is optimal on the day? All right, so we'll kind of pause there. And Spike, that's a great question. I think the for me, a lot of time with when I'm doing a talking head piece, a uh, corporate piece, I'll usually just choose one of them in most cases. Now, if, of course, if I have a situation where the lavalier sounds best, but then they bump it at some point in the, you know, in the performance or the, the interview or whatever we're doing, um, then I will have to cut back and forth. And so usually my goal is to make them sound the same. And usually I'll choose the one that sounds the best to be the reference, <laughs> to be the one that I'm trying to match to. So it really just depends on the room and kind of the characteristics, what else is going on. So, you know, obviously in most cases I prefer the boom because it generally will sound more natural. But the problem is, is that if you're in a noisy situation that it can sometimes be a little problematic. So you'll just pick up more room sound. And if there's a lot of distracting room sound, then I may have to cut to the lavalier. It just really depends. It, 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 it changes from time to time. So the tools that I'm using generally to do that are, of course, EQ is the first one. And Isotope has some really nice tools. There's an EQ match um, that makes it really easy. So you can send one of the audio clips in as a reference to match to, to get the other one to match it. Um, there's an ambiance match um, you know, that kind of does the same thing. So again, to get them sounding very similar to each other. And that, that makes a huge difference. So that's one of the things that I rely on RX to do quite a bit. So you can do this with just a, a standard EQ. That you, that'll get you a lot of the way there. Um, so definitely EQ is available in pretty much every DAW. And you know even the free DaVinci Resolve and Audacity has one as well. So regardless of which DAW you're using, there's, a, there's usually an option there. And if you want to kind of get more into it and really match it up, that's where I find that RX is a really helpful one. There may be others as well. And, by all means, those in the chat here, if you have input on, on those, definitely let us know. All right, um, let's continue on here. The follow-up question is, what effects do you usually apply in the DAW to attempt to even the sound from the different microphone sources? So we actually already kind of covered that. <laughs> um, if it is relevant, my signal chain is an MKH-416 on the boom, ideally with XLR to F6 with a 19 millisecond delay dialed in to match the wireless setup or via the Deity HDTX and backup recorded internally and two Deity Connect lavaliers wirelessly to the F6. I'm currently using Reaper.fm as my DAW. So yeah, Reaper definitely has a very good EQ tool, set of tools. I would use a parametric equalizer. I don't remember what they call it. It's probably RIA EQ, <laughs> as I recall. That's how they name a lot of the plugins if they haven't changed too much since I last used it. But yeah, EQ is the number one tool. And then I'll hop out to RX if I really need to, to dial it in. There's also the new RX, um, uh, what's it called? Dialog Match, I believe it's called. That runs only in Pro Tools for now, last I heard. Um, but that's another set of tools that go along with amb ambient match, Ambience Match um, that really, you know, that's what they're using in the, you know, a lot of the guys that are working in the, the higher end of the film market are using that now, so... Um, anyway, okay, cool. Thanks for the question, Spike. All right, next up from saying, I noticed that the normalize audio levels option in DaVinci Resolve has an option for choosing different normalization modes, including different loudness normalization standards. Do you have experience of loudness normalizing using this and what settings should I use? I looked through your old videos and noticed that you recommended using ITUR BS 1770-3. Is there a difference between ITUR BS 1770-3 and dash 4, especially in terms of what settings I should be using? Well, they've updated the, the standard just a little bit. I'm not intimately familiar with the, the difference there. It matters if you're producing audio for broadcast television, um, but if you're not producing for broadcast television, it's not as critical. So I would just use the latest one, whatever it happens to be. In this case, it's probably 1770-4. Um, so yeah, I just stick with that. If you're if you're just going to web, it doesn't really it doesn't the change from what I can hear is not substantial. So I think there was probably some change in the algorithm that fine tunes itself for a certain set of circumstances of which I'm not aware. But um, yeah, I think you can go with either one of those if you're going to anywhere other than 
to broadcast television. Now, of course, if you're going to broadcast television, then you have to be concerned with what the um, broadcaster requires as well as what the, the locality requires, if it's a country or the European Union or, you know, whatever it is. The ITURBS 1770 standards are what we use here in the United States. And then EBUR 128 is what they use um, typically in the European Union. So, all right. And then next question you ask here. Also, there's an option for relative versus independent set levels if you have multiple audio clips selected. Which one should I be using? Um, generally, I would probably choose relative. What relative does is it takes all of the clips that you have selected and it, it just treats them like they're one single um, audio clip altogether. So they're so they're doing the work of, the, they're measuring the entire set of all the audio clips you have selected, and they're using that to help sort out how to loudness normalize. Now, loudness normalization, remember, typically is going to be applied, you can apply it to a clip, but typically it's going to be applied at the program level, meaning the entire piece. So um, that's definitely one worth looking at there. Okay, so yeah, generally I'd go with relative. So saying thanks for the questions there. And thanks for the input in the chat. Um, it's EQ Match that also works in the standalone app. So thanks, saying for that. All right, moving on here to sh from Shadox. Um, when doing dialogue audio post-processing in Adobe Audition, for example, what are the right steps to follow to apply the effects? Do you normalize first? Um, let, let's just, uh, let me clarify here. Yes, you can, you can apply normalization to any of your clips. And in fact, if you're doing a mix, for example, I sometimes will normalize all my clips to some, something like minus 26 LUFS or LKFS. And the reason I do that is just kind of get them in the same, ca you know, kind of the same range. And then I can start mixing from there and manually adjusting faders or automating faders and things of that nature. So yeah, you can auto, you can normalize first. I wouldn't you're not you're not targeting your final output loudness at this stage. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Then then I would do all of my noise reduction and any cleanup. So typically I'll do just a high pass filter in my EQ just to clean up any sort of low frequency rumble. I'll go back in if if I need to do noise reduction, I will then apply noise reduction. If I um have any issues in terms of like the sound is really harsh, I will go into EQ and do some cuts at various frequencies. I'll kind of, actually what I'll do is I'll boost in a parametric equalizer, I'll boost one frequency and sweep that around until I find the harsh sounding frequency. It'll become really, really obvious if I boost by like nine dB. Once I find that frequency, then I cut there. Usually, you know, I'll start where somewhere around minus three dB and kind of adjust it to taste there. So that's the next step I'll typically do. Um, and then I compress, you know, once I get everything cleaned up and sounding basically how I want it, then I will loudness normalize it. And and remember, if you're just working on a single clip, I don't usually loudness normalize, you know, to any sort of final standard at that point. I'm just trying to get it to sit decently in the mix. Once you're done with a mix um, of all the clips that you've put together, if you are doing a mix like that, then I will loudness normalize it. That's when I'll apply the compression if I need some and then boost it up, normalize it to the loudness standard I'm trying to hit. So for example, if I'm going to web minus 16 LUFS stereo is what I'll generally do. So you're, you're definitely on the right path here, Shadox. You're definitely thinking through things and I think you're on the right path. If you, if you are looking at the course, the Adobe Audition course that we put out, the modules are actually laid out in the order in which I typically apply things. So you can use that as a guide as well. All right. Next up from Han Song. Um, just a little background. There was more than I could actually fit into a slide here, but Han Song is using a um, a Sentrance Mic Port Pro 2. So it's a little uh, single channel USB audio interface that we reviewed probably three, four, maybe maybe it's been longer than that, six weeks ago over on my main channel. It's a great little device. Um, it has an analog limiter built into it. And a cool little device. So here, here's this question in that context. What's the best way to get the audio to my ATEM Mini, you know, from the Sentrance? I have a Shure microphone connected to the Sentrance Mic Port Pro 2 via XLR, and from Sentrance to PC for audio only recording. It works great, but I was wondering how I could send it to the ATEM Mini's mic port. It would streamline the workflow if I could do this. 
I was thinking about using a 3.5 millimeter to 3.5 millimeter jack from Centrance headphone amp to ATEMS Mini like this, but I think I would lose the limiter capacity of the Centrance. If you could jump to that next slide here. So here's the diagram that he sent over. So Hansong, that's actually, that's actually a headphone, it's a headphone output, so it's basically consumer line level. Um, and you could do that if you set the input on the ATEM to line level, and uh, that could work. It is a pretty good headphone amp on the Centrance, so I don't think you'll lose your limiter. I think that's already been applied, and um, so you'll, you won't lose your limiter, so you've still got that. Um, what you do, well, and actually I'm not sure if that headphone output is post analog to digital converter or pre. Um, but it's worth a try. If you want to give that a try and just see how, if you're happy with the results, that could work. Um, but, you know, just give it a listen. And if it's if it's doing what you need, then you're good. So let's go ahead and go back to the question here. And then another possibility you throw out is would a USB to 3.5 millimeter work better? I wasn't sure if something like this is even possible. Yes, there are there are adapters out there, but they actually generally go the opposite direction. So they're usually 3.5 millimeter to USB. So they have analog to digital converters in them. Um, they don't generally go the other direction, which is what you would need. So I don't think that's going to be a possibility here, unless there's a device out there of which I'm not aware. So <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, Hansing, I would I would try the headphone output to the mic input, having the mic input set to line level on your thing there. So let us know how that goes. All right, next up from Jacob. I've been attempting a few live streams lately. Live streams lately. It's been going well, but the audio is always an issue. <clears throat> well, you're in the right place, Jacob. I'm running our uh, four pocket 4Ks into an ATEM Mini and three mics into the Zoom F6, then line out into the ATEM. All that gets routed to OBS through the USB-C of the ATEM Mini. What are the best settings for the F6 when I have three people speaking during the live stream? I've tried using the auto mix feature, but it just feels like it isn't working. I've been mixing sound while switching cameras and graphics. It would be great if the X F6 could mix for me, or am I expecting too much from the auto mix setting? Thanks for your help over the years. That's a, that's a fine question, Jacob. And I think really the thing to keep in mind is auto mix is perhaps the wrong word. <laughs> um, don't read too much into it. All it's basically, at least in theory, doing is it's trying to detect the microphones that aren't current, currently being spoken into and attenuate them a little bit. Just pull them down a little bit so that um, you're not picking up as much noise, like room noise or bleed from other people speaking in the room, so on and so forth. So for that to work, the, the number one thing you have to do is you really need to close mic the people that are in the live stream. So I don't know if you're doing that already, but if you can, you might want to do some experimenting and see if you can get them a little closer to their mics, whatever they happen to be using. That can actually make a difference. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the auto mix feature on the Zoom recorders that I've found is that it um, they're, they're, it's not quite as aggressive as I would like it to be. And so I think they're basically uh, kind of erring on the side of being conservative and not messing things up versus doing a really effective auto mix. So, um, so that's one, I guess that's my main suggestion is if you can, if they're not already being mic'd as close as you can reasonably get them and still sound good, um, you know, try and get them a little bit closer to their microphones because that seems to make a big, big difference. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Let us know in the chat if we missed anything there. Okay. Next up from David, also on the topic of the Zoom F6, I made sure I was, oh, this is a different one actually. Recently while filming with the F6, I made sure I was recording hit stop, and twice in the last month I had two crashes. The audio didn't record. It was like the machine just didn't properly save the file. I was checking to see if there was something I can do to make sure this doesn't happen again. Sometimes it's a pain to redo the whole thing. It's absolutely a pain, David, to do the whole thing over again. So definitely understand where you're coming from there. Um, the, the first thought that comes to my mind, I have not experienced this myself on the F6, but the first thought that comes to my mind is what you might like to do is check your SD cards, and maybe you already have, but if you haven't, um, I would go and do, there's a, if you go into the SD card menu, there are two options for testing your SD card. There's like a quick test and a, I don't know, I can't remember if they call it the other one, a long test or an in-depth test or whatever it is, but I would do the in-depth test. It sounds like it could be an issue with 
compatibility between the F6 and your SD card would be my first, that's the first thing I would check. Um, so um, that's worth checking. If you haven't contacted Zoom already, I would highly recommend that as well. They'll probably say the same thing in terms of checking your card. Um, what I have found is interesting in a lot of audio recorders is, um, you know, audio is quite a bit different from video in terms of the demands it places on the card. So uh, a lot of times I've heard of people buying these like like cutting edge cards and putting them in their audio recorders and then the audio recorders <laughs> not working with them very well. So be careful about, you know, about testing your cards. You don't have to get the most amazing, fastest cards out there like you would for your camera. Um, so just something to keep in mind. So for example, in my all of my audio recorders, I'm using SanDisk, um, some of the older SanDisk. I mean, they're only like, like the 16 gigabyte and the 32 gigabytes are like 14 or $15. And the I think the, the 32 gigs are maybe $24. I mean, they're fairly inexpensive cards and they're just very good and reliable. They're not the fastest cards in the world, but they work really, really well. So there's some thoughts there. Hopefully that helps. Oh, also, yeah, good point. Vincent brought up uh, a point here. Um, oh, uh, sorry, we'll go back to that in just a second. Actually, keep that one bookmarked. Let's go to Vincent's latest comment here, or this chat. Yeah, most manufacturers will compile a list of compatible memory cards, so that's definitely worth checking as well, just to make sure your card's on that list, um, and then also do the test. All right, let's go back to the last one here. Yes, this is a great point. Um, Jacob could also look into giving his guests mic mute boxes. They're usually less than $50, so that's a great idea. So they basically sit in between the mic and the F6 in this case, and you could train your people to actually mute themselves when they're not talking. <laughs> and that could simplify matters for you as well. Or if you don't want them operating them, you could operate them. Um, so that way you're not fiddling with the F6's tiny little dials or knobs. Um, you can just press, basically press a button to mute them. So that's that's definitely worth looking at. Um, also, if you have the F control, or if you'd consider getting the F control, that would make it a little easier too to manually mix. Um, but it's pretty easy because you just pull down the fader on the people that aren't talking. So, okay. All right, next over to Cole. We have an upcoming live stream and I want to use the F6 field recorder for audio capture. We're going to be miking six individuals with a mix of lavalier microphones and boomed microphones. One host will be managing Q&A with five panelists, so there's going to be a decent amount of time when five of the six mics won't be used. Would you set the F6 to auto mix in a scenario like this and feel confident in its function? I remember you did a segment on the auto mix uh, feature in your F6 course. I guess I'm just nervous about the idea of using it live. Any input would be great. All uh, right, so Cole, uh, yeah, the first thing, I, I would feel comfortable using it live. Um, my only concern would be whether or not it does <laughs> enough, um, you know, attenuating of the signal like you want it to. And that was the same thing we were just talking about before. So I'd be more concerned that it doesn't do enough versus not, um, versus doing too much. So yeah, I would, I would feel confident that it's not going to do too much and it's not going to create really awkward things. What I will say is this is again, Again, it's, it works best when you have people very close to the microphones. It's really made for like panel discussions and situations where people are, you know, pretty much up on their mic. Um, if you put too much distance between them, on, like on a boom, that's when things can get a little bit, um, it has a harder time figuring out who is not talking into their mic because if the mic is say 18 inches away, 30, 40 centimeters away, maybe from closer to 40 centimeters away or more, um, it has a harder time being able to tell if, you know, who's talking and which mic needs to be attenuated. So that's why close miking makes a big difference with auto mix. So there's some things to keep in mind there. Um, also, you bought an MKH-50 last week. I am stoked about it. I'm stoked for you, Cole. That's pretty cool. And that that's a fantastic classic microphone. So I hope it ends up working well for you. I think it's a, it's a good choice there. All right. We are now down to the question from Alan. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is actually a lighting question. So um, we're going to kind of shift gears for this is our sound for video session, but we all love lighting too. So <laughs> or most of us do. Um, so here's the thing. How did you start when you started gear wise? I don't know if you've done a review of your journey. One light, a set of, the, of three, 
how do you pr- how have you progressed and how do you make your basic go to for one job now would be good to fill if you're light on questions haha ha, no puns okay anyway <laughs> um so alan let me start there so yes i very much started with a budget kit i went to the home depot here in the united states so your hardware store bought some clamp lights little shop lights or little metal reflector lights and put some bulbs in them and that was my first lighting kit for video and i used you know those you've seen the five, photographic five in one reflectors um, those things are awesome usually the center section is a scrim something you can shoot light through and it softens it up beautifully you can gang up multiple shop lamps which i did often often i'd put two of them behind a five in one reflector scrim and get that in as close to the talent as i could and that makes a beautiful soft key light And then I would use another one as a, you know, like a hair light or a rim light from behind off to the side. And that's a great little kit. And you can do that for well under $100. So definitely a great place to start. And I think now um, things are a little different for me when I have, you know, when I'm getting paid. (laughs) Um, The situation is a little bit different. I don't have quite as much time to, I got to move fast. I need something that's really durable. So having an exposed bulb like in a shop lamp is not going to, you know, not going to work as well in the rough and tumble world of production. So I generally now in terms of lighting will take, um, I have several Lupo LED panels and those are probably my go-to when it comes to my corporate work when I'm solo shooting. Now, if I'm doing something on the corporate side, that's a little bit more like a narrative. Often I'll bring, um, more like one of the aperture lights, like one of the COB 300 X or 300 D Mark II. And I'll use those and put a soft box on them. And then I can also bring the other attachments like the Leco, you know, uh, what do they call it? I can't really, I think they call it the spotlight mount. Um, so that gives me some more options there too, if I want to do some kind of stylized things. The barn doors I really like and use those quite a bit. So um, yeah, I guess my three light kit now is a, probably a Super Panel 60 soft RGB. They'll generally use that as a key. And then I'll have two 30 uh, Lupo Super Panel 30s. Um, usually like the, one of them will be the RGB and the other one will be the bike or the dual color model. So that can get me pretty much everything I need. And the nice thing is if I'm operating solo, I've got my rock and roller cart. I can throw all three of those on there. I can throw three stands into this like bag that I have attached to the, to the handle on the cart. Um, along with all my other camera gear, I've got a Peli case probably usually with my, my camera kit now. <clears throat> And then that can usually, and then I've usually got a backpack too with some other stuff in it. All the, you know, the audio, the audio gear now actually sits on a cart, so it has its own cart. Um, I got a sound cart mini last uh, December, January. Yes, Emma, Emma whispered December to me. We went to True Audio <laughs> in Burbank, California, and I got to kind of check that out in person. That was fun. And uh, Emma gives me the thumbs up. She says that was a lot of fun to go to True Audio as well. So. <laughs> Um, in any case, so that's that's what my kit generally looks like now. All right, so here he goes, continuing here from Alan's question. I suppose this question came out of looking at buying a proper light myself. So far, my setup is the Dirty DIY 3-Light Rig Film, Film Riot, Home Depot LEDs on stands with a couple of practicals and a lime cube using a 5-in-1 diffuser reflector or 4x4 polystyrene board for bounce. It's served well for indoor medium-sized room, but I wouldn't know where to start with outdoors. Uh, What I would say for outdoors, uh, what I find more useful is usually having scrims and things like that where you can, you know, you can soften the light. So rather than trying to overpower the light, you know, on a bright sunny day, if it is going to be a bright sunny day, then having a scrim that you can put between your talent and the sun, especially, you know, if you can, a four by four is awesome, but if you can't, the five in one scrim can help too, um, or you can soften things up a little bit. So if you're getting this really harsh effect, you can do that. You can also put their back to the sun or off to one side behind them. That will help a lot too. And what that does for you is it kind of puts their light or their face in kind of um, open shade instead. Um, so they don't get the kind of the raccoon eye look. So that's another thing you can do outdoors. Um, so definitely, you know, just kind of put put somebody outdoors and turn them around and go walk around them and find out, figure out what's going to work best there. But I, I find that bounce and scrims are probably the very first thing one should invest in for outdoor shooting. 
Uh, continuing on, Lupo 8x8 looks fitting. Um, so he's talking about the Lupo uh, makes a smaller panel. I think they call it the action panel. That is a good little one. Um, that's not going to be... That one's going to be harder to use as a key, in my opinion. You could, you could, um, but I'm not sure you're going to be over to overpower the sun generally with that. Um, so I like the range of brilliance and color. Would it make good key light outdoors as well as in interview, interview situations? Indoors, I think, yes. Outdoors, probably not as much. It's not quite that powerful. I mean, it's powerful, but it's going to be... Um, I don't know if you're going to overpower. If you're trying to overpower the sun, it's kind of a different story. Then you need to move to some of the bigger lights there to get that working. I'd love to stretch to the Lupo 30 or 60 and have one of each. And then there's the inbuilt battery option with the Stella 8000. I think I'm scared, uh, sorry, secretly worried someone is going to call and ask me to do a job for money. <laughs> well, when somebody does call and ask you to do a job for money, then build into the budget the light that you want to use and add that to the kit. So that's how that works. Um, now, if they're, you know, if you're going to do something on a really tight budget, then you provide the services on a really tight budget. So you don't buy lights at that point. But, but I think really, again, getting out and learning, you know, how you can work with the sun instead of against it um, to get a, a decent look. So, you, so you, people, if they're going to hire you and not have as large a budget, which is totally legitimate, and that's fine. Um, but they have to be more flexible as well. They need to be willing to change locations if you need them to change locations to get the lighting right. So you're going to have to be a little bit more of an advisor in that case there, potentially. Okay, question two is, you're on a desert island and you need a rig. You can have three lights and power recharge is not a problem, but must be good for outdoor and in-hut scenes, both day and night. You need to have saved these from whatever vehicle brought you there, i.e. must be portable. <laughs> a free parking option, as in Monopoly, will allow one century stand on island, but it's already being used by audio. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I guess in that case, I'd probably look for, as a key, probably one of the Aperture, um, the 300D Mark II, probably. Um I prefer the 300X, but its output isn't quite as much. It's more like a 120 with bi bicolor, so not as much output there. Um, so that'd be my key light, and then I'd get a couple of Lupo panels as well, probably a 60 and a 30, or maybe a 60 and an action panel. So something along those lines would do nicely. And uh, sounds like a pretty nice desert island I'd like to visit sometime, Alan, so thanks for that. <laughs> All right, I think that's everything we had on the questions there. So thanks everyone for submitting their questions ahead of time and hope that was helpful for everybody. Um, let's go take a look at the chat and see if we have any questions there. If you do wanna ask a specific question, go ahead and preface it with at Curtis Judd Audio and that will bring it up. Fairlight, Fairlight and more Fairlight or more advanced audition course. Okay, fair enough. And that is, you, you actually got me there. That is what else is in the running here for our next course is I'm not sure if it's going to be Fairlight or Audition, but we probably are going to jump in and do something on mixing in a little bit more detail. So we have to make some decisions there. Um, so fine question or fine request there. Do more expensive wireless transmitters give you better sounding audio or just better build quality? Ah, that's a great question. Uh, they generally, well, there's there are a couple of categories from my experience. Um, Even some of the consumer ones can sound pretty decent, so pretty good. <clears throat> and there, it's not just build quality. Build quality is a factor, unquestionably. You know, once you get out of the consumer range into the prosumer range, start getting into the Sennheiser G4s, um, they're still going to be plastic partly and partly metal. And then when you get into the higher end, generally you're looking at all metal chassis and... Um, you know, much better build quality. So build quality is part of it. But I think a big thing to, con to consider is that one of the huge differences is if you're using a system that uses 2.4 gigahertz, which is the same frequency range as Wi-Fi, um, you're going to probably fight, you're going to be in a bad situation more often. <laughs> it can be perfectly fine if you're working indoors and you don't have a ton of other competing traffic. And that's great. But if you run into a situation where things start dropping out, it can be really tricky working with those 2.4 gigahertz systems. The Deity Connect system gives you some options. You can up the, the output power. 
You can go into a higher latency mode and that might help in certain circumstances. Um, but there comes a point where you just can't do anything else. And that's where the systems that are more expensive generally, not always, but generally, will transmit in the UHF frequencies, at least here in the United States. And so those frequencies are reserved for use for wireless microphone systems and other stuff like that. So the nice thing about those is typically they're wideband tunable, so you can choose a different frequency if one is not working out. That's a huge, huge difference. And so while you may not notice a huge difference in terms of audio quality alone, being able to get audio that's not dropping out or getting interfered with all, all, this, you know, all the time is um, really worth a lot. So that's, that's my impression. And then I think, yes, on the higher end systems, I think it very much does make a difference in terms of sound quality. My, um, I've been working with Audio Limited A10, and that system sounds really good. Um, and they're using that on, you know, high-end productions as well. So I went back and recently rewatched the um, Star Wars Solo movie. <laughs> and that was actually one of the first ones that used the Audio Limited A10 for their wireless booms. And um, sounded really good to me. And it sounds very good on the, on the projects where I use the A10 as well. So there is a, there is a difference in sound quality as well. So that, that's a factor. Um, is it a night and day difference? Well, it depends on which system you're comparing it to. The Deity Connect system, I actually really like the Deity Connect system. It just is a little bit on the noisy side for my, you know, in terms of self noise. Um, you can tune it and you can kind of squeeze the best performance out of it, but there are still times um, when you're doing it, especially sort of a more intimate interview where you, you do have a very good quiet location. That's when it starts to kind of poke its noise, you know, that noise floor out or that self noise out and it starts to get a little bit problematic, but otherwise it's a great system. So that's kind of my impression. I, the Roadlink system was pretty solid for me for a long time um, and I still use it as a backup. Um, so it's worked pretty well. Um, but in terms of audio quality, certainly with the included microphone, it's not as good as what I get out of my A10 system. So there are differences. I guess that's a long way to answer your short question. <laughs> All right. Are the super chats that are displayed in the live stream automatic or do you activate them manually? If automatic, how do you do it with Aaron's script? Um, so yes, we have a voice activated director sitting behind the scenes just over here. <laughs> she's actually putting those up on the screen. So she's, she's the one in charge of the show and, um, Yes, we are using Aaron's uh, JavaScript to put this the chat up on the screen here tonight. So we actually use Ecamm Live as well. So last night we did a live stream over on my other channel and we used Ecamm Live. The main reason we used Ecamm Live last night is that uh, we were using a USB microphone for that particular demonstration. So the USB microphone does not go into the ATEM Mini. Um, and so that means it goes into the computer and so they both have to go in the computer so you can stream out from there. Right now, tonight, we're streaming directly from the ATEM Mini. It has an Ethernet port, and it's going out on the internet and sending the stream directly to YouTube. So we're bypassing the computer. The computer is not doing the encoding and sending it to YouTube. So that's the difference we have tonight. But no, not automatic. It is, it's a manual process with a very skilled director behind the scenes. <laughs> so um, you said you aren't a fan of head-worn mics some of which are eye-wateringly expensive, Countryman DPA. Can you elaborate and talk about directional versus omnidirectional? Thanks. I am actually am a fan of head-worn mics. What I'm not a fan of is cardioid lavalier mics. Um, they have their place, but they all of the cardioid lavaliers that I've heard don't sound very good, and they're generally much larger. Um, so that's what I don't love, and it's just because they don't sound that great. But they have their utility. I think a head-worn mic is actually a great choice for someone who is doing an exercise, you know, type of video, like a like as a trainer, um, cooking demonstrations, it just uh, gets you out of the the issue of clothing rustle. It's pretty straightforward and simple. Um, some people hate wearing them, but um, all sorts of musicians, um, uh, you know, they dance around on stage with these head worn mics, and they get some pretty phenomenal sound. So. I actually do quite like the head-worn mics. Um, yeah, so there's some thoughts there. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat, Brandon. All right, in your NTR review, how close was the wall behind the mic and what kind of surface was it? Oh, hi, Alan. 
Thanks for joining us. Um, that's actually a bass trap. So that's a GIK acu acoustics. Um, it's one that you can kind of move around. It's a portable one. So it has in it, they don't use rock wool, but it's a material kind of like rock wool. And I think it's a three or it's like three inches thick. So it's not super um, deadening, but it, it does do, it does do some things just to prevent, you know, sound from bouncing around the entire room. We also had one behind the mic as well. And I was, all of that was shot here in this same room here where we already have some bass trapping. So the idea there was just to really isolate as best we could. So fine question. Thank you for that. And hope you're doing well. All right. Uh, are you still looking for a Motu 2 or Motu 4 audio interface? Um, well, I'd like, I'd love to review one. Um, so yes, I guess the basic or the answer the question, the answer to that question is yes, I believe so. Okay, what would be a good first shotgun mic type that can cover a variety of situations for dialogue? All the best, Oren. Um, well, I think a, a short shotgun mic would not be a bad choice at all. So I think something like a Deity S Mic Two would be a great place to start. Uh, I don't know what your budget is, so that's that's one in kind of the mid range. On the lower end, if you really need to keep the the but you know if you've got working with a pretty tight budget, um, a lot of people I know have started with an Audio Technica AT eight seventy five R, and they get good results. In fact, my friend Photo Joseph uses that in his live streams. If you've ever happened to see his live streams, they sound pretty good, and he's you know he's just using that. It's less than two hundred dollar microphone, so that's a good choice. Um, if you can move up in budget a little bit. Um, I really like the Rode NTG5 and the Rode NTG3. So the NTG5 is about a $500 mic, and the 3 is a $700 or $800 mic. Um, the NTG3 has a much bassier, kind of more broadcast sound to it, and the NTG5 sounds a little bit more natural and is smaller um, and comes with a kit of uh, shock mount and some other accessories, which are really nice as well. So those are some thoughts there. I think those would be a great place to start. And you can use those, you know, we come back to the question of indoor using a shotgun microphone indoors. Can you do that? And I think the answer is, of course, yes, you can. Um, just make sure you get it aimed correctly and it shouldn't be a problem. And, and I would also work to, you know, control any reverberation in the room as well. I want to start live mixing with F controller and the F4. Once I have the gain properly set for both mics, how far do I pull the fader down when the talent isn't speaking? Well, that is a, um, remember that the, <clears throat> the dB scale is logarithmic, so um, it'll make a bigger change. You know, it, pulling it down at the first will make a bigger change than when you get, or is it the other, is it the inverse? Uh, smaller movements closer to unity make less of a difference than the same movement farther away. So um, use your ears. Put, yeah, I would do some practice, put on some headphones and put a couple of people in front of mics and kind of play with it and see. Oftentimes, you know, depending on the situation, I'm pulling down somewhere around 9 dB is not unusual. Now you have to be careful too. If, you're, if, you, if it's not scripted, you're going to have to be right on top of those faders. So if somebody starts talking unexpectedly, you've got to be able to get back up quickly um, and anticipate those. So it's something you have to kind of, it's, a, it's an art. It's, a, it's definitely an art. <laughs> so... Um, those are some thoughts there. I would start at somewhere around 9 dB, but d definitely use your ears and experiment. All right. Um, I'm having trouble connecting my Mix Pre 3.2 out to my GH5 mic input. I've set the levels for both devices using tone. I'm getting some kind of humming or static sound. Yes, this is not uncommon with that, um that combination. If I connect the MixPre-3 to one of my ATEM mini input ports, I get the same noise when the port is set to mic input. Once I change it to line input, the noise goes away. Okay. So, um, a couple of things. Number one, uh, go ahead and try doing the same thing. Disconnect your, if, if you do have the camera mounted on top of your MixPre, disconnect it and see if the buzz goes away. Um, we've had a lot of reports of that happening. Um, if you put some sort of insulation between the MixPre and the camera, Oftentimes that'll take care of that buzzing. You can also use a uh, line isolator transformer. You can buy these over on Amazon. They're actually made for um, like using those little transmitters in your car. Like if you have an older car that doesn't connect via Bluetooth and you have one of those Bluetooth transmitters, 
Um, you can connect your phone to this and then this into the trans. So you connect your phone, uh, it wasn't showing it. Connect your phone to this as a 3.5 millimeter input jack. And the other end you connect to your um, Bluetooth transmitter and that isolates it and takes away the buzz. And you can try one of those as well. But what I would first do is get the camera and the mix pre disconnected if you had them, if you had the camera mounted on the mix pre and see if that makes a difference first. If so, then I think you just need some insulation between your camera and your mix pre. And others, if you have experience with that as well, please definitely let us know in the chat here. All right, what would be your preferred method of inserting pre-recorded interview clips into a live stream? Using an ATEM Mini Pro and prefer to stream via RTMP, but open to software if there's a benefit. Um, well, the ideal way to do it is to use a HyperDeck, <laughs> but those aren't cheap. I think the HyperDeck Mini is, uh, if you're not familiar with those, it's another product made by Blackmagic Design. It's used often in broadcast, and what it does is it's, it's basically a recorder and a playback device, and you can just put the pre-recorded material on an SD card in the HyperDeck Mini and actually play that back uh, to the ATEM directly. So they both have to be connected to Ethernet. And uh, you can do that. So that's that would be the preferred method. Now, what we do here, for example, I don't have a HyperDeck yet. Um, so what we do here, for example, when we're playing the music at the start is I'm just using my phone into the line input on the A10 Mini. So that seems to be working pretty well for us as well. So if you're doing pre-recorded audio, that's definitely an option that works, I think, pretty nicely. I don't know if anyone, does anyone have complaints about the intro outro music? Does it not sound high fidelity? Okay. <laughs> um, all right, cool. May you review the Sony wireless that connect to hot shoes of their mirrorless cameras, this SMA P3D interface shoe adapter with the URX P03D wireless receiver. Lots are buying the new Sony A7S III. Um, I, would, I would love to do that, but I don't own any Sony cameras. And... Um, I will see what I can do. But I, I can't promise I can do that, so I'll try. <laughs> Thank you for the request. Um, follow up on the head-worn mic, and thanks for the clarification. I've read that some folks prefer omnidirectional to directional head-worn. Can you comment? Yes, in fact, um, Ken commented on this. And actually, if you can go back and find Ken's comment, um, one of the things that's tricky about cardioid lobs is that if anyone turns off axis, it's like a massive EQ shift. Um, so the sound changes dramatically. So that's the that's one of the big problems with um, that's more body worn lavs. Um, if you put it on the head, like you'll see a lot of times in theater. And Ken, you can speak to this much better than I can. But um, if you in theater, a lot of times they'll hide it in their hair. And in fact, in Hamilton, <laughs> if you looked at the Disney Plus version, the you know the filmed version of Hamilton. Um, even on some of the like the promo shots that they show on the landing page on Disney Plus, um, some of the performers have these. They have one of them had two lobs sticking like well out of their hair. It was well in front of their hairline, which kind of surprised me. Usually they try to keep it within the hairline, but you know theater is craziness. I mean, it's I have the utmost respect for people that run uh, live sound for something like like a production like Hamilton. Just totally amazing to me that the, the quality of sound they got for the version that I saw on Disney Plus was just phenomenal. i just so impressed. But anyway, um, we, yeah, so here's what Ken said. We don't like to use cardioid head-worn lobs in theater because any slight movement of the face causes a large EQ shift. So yeah, so there's some, some input there as well. Okay. Is the camera supplying picture-in-picture -picture mic or phantom power when set to mic level? Line level is the better option. Uh, is camera supplying picture? Oh, sorry, plug-in power, not picture-in-picture. -picture. <laughs> plug-in power or phantom power when set to mic level. It is providing plug-in power. Um, so yeah, yeah I would say that line level is the better option. I wouldn't trust, um, you know, if you don't have to have a more consumer-oriented device like an A10 Mini do the amplification for your audio, then don't. And from an F6 or a, or a Sound Devices Mix Pre, you don't. They, they can output line level, so just switch your input on the A10 to line level and just bypass that issue altogether. So yeah, hopefully that's, that's helpful there. Okay. 
Did you have any experience with replacing lav cables with Mogami or other recommended brands? Oh, I didn't know. I don't know. You know who, who, who we should ask? Alan at SoundSpeeds. I don't have any experience replacing lav cables. I have to send them into the shop when I need them replaced <laughs> um, or rewired. So um, I don't have any advice on that. But maybe uh, our buddy uh, Alan, if you have any input or anyone else that has experience with that, would be great. All right. Um, let's put up Andre's uh, note there. Um, yes, I actually saw these, Andre. Thanks for bringing this up. On uh, Adam Savage tested the YouTube channel. Um, he went and talked to the sound guys uh, about, and I say guys, men and women, um, that were running Hamilton in San Francisco. And so it talked all about the mic systems they're using. The, uh, the main actors were wearing, the main cast were wearing uh, redundant microphone systems. So that was pretty cool. So they talk all about mic placement. They talk about um, the redundant systems they have on the main actors. Um, and actually they have to change over to the redundant mic quite often in live productions like that. So there's some great information over there. So definitely take uh, a look at that. Look up Adam Savage Tested. And I know I saw the one about Hamilton. So that one looked really good. So definitely some good information there. Thanks for that, Andre. Leave that to the manufacturer or someplace like Wilcox that does repairs on lobs. You shouldn't try to repair a lob yourself. That I, that's generally how I approach it too. So <laughs> thanks for that, Alan. Would it be okay to use mics with a 3.5 millimeter jack with a Zoom F6 using the 3.5 millimeter to XLR adapters? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, but you need to get the right kind of adapter. So lavalier 3.5 millimeter microphones, lavalier microphones almost always require plug-in power, three, three to five volts DC. So you're going to need to get an adapter that is actually able to take the phantom power from the F6 and convert it down to three to five volts plug-in power. So the ones that I, there are lots of them out there. Um, the ones that I'm aware of are the Rode VXLR Plus. Make sure you get the plus version. Um, I know Sennheiser makes one. Don't know what the model name is. I believe Remote Audio. Is it Remote Audio that makes one? There are several different different companies that make them. But if you really, you know, I would go look at somewhere like True Audio or Gotham Sound, Location Sound Corp, Audio Department, one of the, um, you know, sound for film houses, and just take a look on their website. They'll they'll definitely have various options there. But yes, you can use it, but you have to get that type of adapter that converts the power from 48 volts phantom down to 3 to 5 volts. Is there something you can wrap 3.5 millimeter TRS cables to shield them from RF interference? Whew. Well, the good lavalier microphones will already have, generally have that capability. Um, I don't know, Alan, do you know? <laughs> um, I've generally just used the, you know, the higher quality mics, you know, if I'm, Here's the thing. If you're on a tight budget and you're not getting paid, um, then you have to do a retake and or you have to find another location or something like that. And that's fine. Um, but if you are getting paid, then that's when you're kind of wanna, probably going to want to step up into um, you know, a more professional level mic that actually has RF shielding in their cabling. So those are, those are some of my thoughts there. I don't know if any of you out there have other thoughts on that as well. That would be really helpful here for everyone if you could share that. All right. I just got a MixPre 6.2 and an Orca OR28. Congratulations. Um, with the L-mount battery sled, it is lifted just off the floor and the knobs and bars are just below the rim of the bag. I like it, but is that too close? Knobs and bars are just below the rim of the bag. Um, this is really a question about what's comfortable for you, um, from my point of view. So I believe at least my Orca bags came with the little risers and they had two different risers. They have like the traditional pads that you can put at the bottom, kind of stack them. Um, or they had the lift system as well. I don't know if the OR28 came with the lifts as well. Well, they have Velcro that lets you adjust the height, but just do what's comfortable for you. Generally, you don't want it sticking out too far. Um, but you want it at a comfortable level where you can operate all of the knobs and get to that, especially the headphone knob on the side. 
So those are the main things to consider from my point of view, but do what's comfortable for you and keep, you know, keep the mixer protected. So if, if the bag, for whatever reason, tips over or something, um, it's not going to destroy your mixer. That's generally how I approach it. <clears throat> All right. Adriana Brannon is the A2 on the San Fran production of Hamilton. She was trained by another lady, A2, Anna Lee Craig, both crafty and sharp technicians. Completely agreed. Uh, Adriana is the one I think they talked to in that video that I saw. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We've been breathing a little bit of uh, vaporized California here in Utah <laughs> the last couple of days, so excuse me here. Need to get a drink. All right. Um, yeah, sharp as attack, and she knew her stuff clearly. Um, she had an amazing system for keeping track of the microphones, maintaining them. Um, yeah, really great stuff. Definitely highly recommended to go check that out for sure. Um, good info. Thanks for that, Ken. There are tapes made that you could wrap around a lav, but you'll make it thick, scratchy to the talent, and overall bad. You will likely destroy your lav if you try to remove it, too. Stiff badness, no. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. Can you get a lav converted to micro dot reliably? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have not had anything converted. I've always bought the micro dot versions so that, you know, I could, you know, adapt them to the different systems. So I don't have experience converting them to micro dot. I would think so. And the reason I say that, Lloyd, is that the, the micro dot connectors that you purchase usually have in them the electronics necessary to do anything that's required for the particular connector that you're going to. Um, I don't know, Alan, or anyone else here, if you know specifically, Ken, um, but I think it's possible that you can do that. Um, so, there we go. Good question, Lloyd. Thank you for that. Uh, might the IR emitted by incandescent lights ever present an issue with color or exposure? Second, any recommendation offhand for xenon tube UV flashes? Photographing fluorescence. Uh, thank you, Curtis and director. The director's Emma. <laughs> so thank you, Emma. Um, let's see. So we're on a lighting question here. The infrared emitted by incandescent lights ever present present an issue with color or exposure? I haven't found them to. I mean, it's very camera dependent. So most cameras, a lot of cameras have an infrared filter in them. Um, Blackmagic had some issues with that early on. <laughs> where they didn't, and actually some cameras, may, I don't know, maybe they're moving, I, a lot of them are moving away from filters um, on the more kind of hybrid cameras at least. But um, I know Blackmagic had some issues with that, so when they made the, the Ursa Mini Pro, they added infrared filtering to the ND filters. So I, I never... I didn't really find it to be a problem with incandescent lighting, so I never experienced that with the particular cameras I've used. So it's going to be really camera dependent, I think. Any recommendation offhand for xenon tube UV flashes? I don't... I've been out of the photographic world for quite some time. In fact, I was um, cleaning out my closet here the other day, and I pulled out a Novatron 400-watt uh, second studio flash that I, it was my very first flash that I bought in 1994. <laughs> still works. I pulled it out and tried it out. It still works. Um, but I don't, I've, that's just to give you an illustration of how far out of that game I am. So I don't unfortunately have any recommendations there. Uh, let's see here. Even with a CL1, I can't get rid of preamp noise when recording SM7B into an RME Babyface Pro. Give up and use a condenser or a better interface with more clean gain. Thinking new Apogee Symphony desktop. Oh, wow. Um, I get excited when you talk about Apogee Symphony. That sounds pretty cool. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar. I mean, in terms of firsthand usage, I've not used either one of those. Um, so you're using a cloud lifter with the SM7B into the RME Babyface. I'd always heard that the RMEs were pretty clean, so I don't know how much gain they are able to supply. Uh, but, gosh, I don't know. It's a tough call. I don't know what your room is like. Is If it's not... Yeah, I don't know. You could go either way. 
you could definitely go either way. If there's any way you can try it first, I would try it first. Um, I think I don't know if the Apogee Symphony, if they update those, if that's been updated recently or not, and you know, kind of what its characteristics are. So I don't have any recommendations on that particular combination. Um, all right, but anyway, if, if anyone else in the chat has some input, that would be really helpful and appreciated. Sorry, I couldn't help more on that. Any thoughts on buying the, an audio limited A10 from Europe to get the internal recording feature in the United States, other than not having the 600 megahertz band, of course? Any thoughts on buying an audio limited A10 from Europe to get the internal recording? Well, um, I don't want to get anyone in trouble, so uh, uh, patents are enforced in theory. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I have heard other people doing things like that with the Deity Connect system. They'll buy the um, the non-US version so they can have the recording functionality because the manufacturers ship all the versions of their wireless systems um, without the recording capability, except, for example, the A10. You can record wireless boom mics. The patent only applies, evidently, to lavalier mics. So I don't have anything I can recommend beyond that without getting anybody in trouble. <laughs> Which XLR mute buttons do you recommend? I have experienced bad luck with transients using them. Um, I don't have experience with them, but, um, and I apologize, I don't remember who made that recommendation. It was a good one, but if you do have a recommendation, please, um, if you'd share that, that would be awesome. Okay. Any thoughts on the Zaxcom Diva 4? Um, I've seen it at NAB on the show floor, and that's it. That's my full exposure to it. So it's a very capable mixer and system. Uh, I think the thing is with with Zaxcom, my impression is that it's kind of like buying an Apple product, um, where if you go kind of all in on the system, the ecosystem that they produce, it's beautiful. There's so many amazing things that they're able to accomplish. Um, but if you're kind of mixed and matched, it's not as, you know, it's not as, it doesn't put you ahead of using a sound devices or, you know, some other Aton, Kantar, or anything else like that. So it, it's a great, from what I can tell, a great kit. So definitely some people. I would be more interested in, in looking right now, kind of for my own curiosity, at the Zaxcom. Diva obviously is much bigger mixer, recorder, bigger than the Nomad even. Um, but uh, I would be more interested in looking at the Nova right now. That looks like a cool little mixer with capabilities that are amazing. Amazing. Try calling some place like True Audio, Gotham Sound, or Wilcox, and they should be able to wire a cable for micro dot. It may make the connector bigger, and it won't be strain relief like stock micro dot. Okay, so some good insights. Thanks for that, Alan. Appreciate that. That's in re response to um, Lloyd's question earlier there. What's a good DIY project you've lately come across for audio? Oh, wow. Can you think of any? We've well, the, the thing is, what's that? They recorded me earlier this week. Oh yeah, well, we did. Re we pulled out the ribbon mic to record some music instruments. Um, I wasn't really DIY though. Sure. We haven't done a lot of DIY because we're. I don't know why we haven't done a lot. We haven't done a lot of DIY because manufacturers keep sending us stuff here, so we need to get out and do some more DIY. Is what we need to do. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have any. Wait, do oh, I, actually, well, I did learn how to solder, and I'm soldering my own XLR cables now. There's some DIY for you. I think I would highly recommend it. By the way, we got a new Weller um, soldering iron, and uh, it was not this cable. It was actually this one over here. We um, we have a different boom arm over here that had internal cabling, and so I had to um, wire the XLR connector myself. So that's a, that's a. That's the coolest DIY we've done recently. <laughs> um, okay, we have an Octava MK012 stereo, XLR 1 and 2 to the Zoom F6, line out to a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K, to HDMI into an ATEM Mini Pro, into a, and a USB mic in Zoom call. Should I set output to 16-bit in Zoom F6? Or what is ATEM's output? Um, well, so when you're outputting from, hmm, wait a minute. So you're 
so you're going into the zoom f6 line out so you're going line out that's analog so there's no 16 or whatever you know you're not you're not choosing a word length there so i'm not sure i totally understand the question but um is it recommended to set 16 bit in the zoom f6 black magic pocket cinema camera 6k wondering what the output from the black magic pocket cinema camera 6k hdmi output um, i don't know the answer to that offhand but if you just do a recording on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K with your zoom attached to it. Bring it into your digital uh, audio. Well, you can import the video file into a digital, digital audio workstation or into your nonlinear editor, video editing app. And it should tell you the bit depth there of the, the file that was recorded by the Pocket Cinema Camera. So um, you have to keep in mind that when you interconnect stuff like that, you're going back to analog and then back into digital in each case. So typically, so... Um, the bit, it all gets re-encoded again every single time. So hopefully that makes sense. Any experience with rear projectors versus green screen? LG have a new short throw laser projector, which looks really interesting for rear projection. Um, I don't have per firsthand experience, but I did watch recently, um, for those of you that saw The Mandalorian, um, they have a, also on Disney Plus, they have a you can see I'm pretty excited. I just we got Disney Plus recently, <laughs> um, but they have a behind the scenes on the, how they shot the Mandalorian and unreal. Definitely worth seeing that to talk about how they did all the rear projection. A lot of that was actually shot in studio, not on location, and just wow. the The projectors they're using and they're using um, some VR technology. Um, so that as the camera moves, it does all of the parallax um, on the rear projection. It's just, and it looks really good. I mean, if you've seen uh, Mandalorian, I think you can say, yeah, this looks good. What they've done is, is a really impressive thing. So I haven't looked at the new LG um, short throw laser projectors, but looks really, it does look really interesting for rear projection. Uh, does the Rode pod mic need something like a cloud lifter or can I just go straight into my F6? So I think with the F6, you shouldn't need a cloud lifter. That's got enough gain that you should be fine without it. So you can go up to 75 dB on that. The pod mic shouldn't need that much. So you should be more in the probably the 60, maybe 65 if you've got someone with a really soft voice and if they're way back from the microphone. So you should be fine. No need for a cloud lifter in my opinion. All right, friends, we're a few minutes over. So sadly, this session is coming to an end. I want to thank everyone for the questions and also for those of you that contributed here in the chat. I can't I can't do it without you guys. So thanks so much for being here and uh, for contributing. Um, get out there and make some great sound and we'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.